To kick off Energy Week, I want to introduce you to Dr. Jolette Portlock, the Executive Director of Sustainable Pittsburgh. It's a nonprofit organization working to support decision making to build a fundamentally equitable, resilient, healthy, and prosperous region. Sustainable Pittsburgh regularly works with hundreds of partners in the region, including local governments, nonprofits, and the business community to ensure stakeholders are connected, sustainable knowledge is shared and applied, and all people can succeed. Prior to her role at Sustainable Pittsburgh, Dr. Portluck saw, served as Associate Director of Science and Research at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and as Executive Director of Communitopia, a, a nonprofit based uh, in Pittsburgh that focuses on climate change communication. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in anthropology from MIT, now that's interdisciplinary, and a PhD in genetics from Stanford University, my gosh. Her work focuses on community building around sustainability topics with a particular interest in making important scientific, technical, or complex information accessible and useful. Dr. Portlock has worked on environmental issues at local, state, and federal levels, and currently serves on the Allegheny County Board of Health. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Portlock to the podium. We're so glad you're here. Good morning. That was, that was energetic, I think, for the time frame that we're in, kind of midweek. Good morning. Good morning. All right, great. Um, and thank you so much to uh, Bill and to Daniel for the introduction and the uh, invitation to be here with you today. I'm very, uh, very honored to be here speaking with this group. Um, a lot of the introductory material about Sustainable Pittsburgh um, has already been mentioned in my introduction. I'm sorry, how do I advance the, okay. Oh, we're good, we're good. I figured it out. MIT, remember? <laughs> yeah, so um, let's see. So my job this morning is really to offer a framework and a stage setting uh, for the conversations today around industrial decarbonization. And uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do was, was talked about. We work broadly in the 10 county region of southwestern Pennsylvania as a general base, but some of our work takes us uh, even beyond those borders and some of it is, is hyper-focused in community. So I bring a bunch of different perspectives um, to this conversation. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is really challenge everyone here to think broadly and boldly and creatively about the issue before us. And I urge everyone in the room to enter into this looking for what is feasible today and what is necessary for tomorrow. Our mission and vision were already covered in the introduction, um, so I'm not gonna reread them for you. Um, but what I want to uh, stress here in thinking about the work that we do at Sustainable Pittsburgh is that it is inherently interdisciplinary. Uh, sustainability isn't any one thing a community or an organization can do. It's really at the intersection of all of these things, equity, resilience, health, and prosperity. And we have to get a lot more comfortable, I think, with that complexity and being able to address all of these issues at once. Um, Sustainable Pittsburgh exists to help our region navigate that complexity in strategic and effective ways. And at the end of the day, it's really about how we continue to thrive into the future. So what do we do? Well, our work sort of fits into three buckets, roughly. Um, our team of subject matter experts has designed and manages a suite of designation programs that offer recognition for company sustainability achievements, and a framework to understand and track their progress. Uh, so these programs are open to restaurants, small retail businesses, local governments, and a wide variety of workplaces at small, medium, and large organizations. In addition, we host a few networks to promote leadership 
and enable peer-to-peer -peer learning and targeted action on sustainability topics. And I'll talk a little bit about that across my next slides. And the last bullet is more uh, flexible in terms of emergent and urgent challenges and the approaches that we're able to bring to those collaboratively um, to bring specific action on needed, needed, needed uh, problems. So one of the networks that we host, uh, which many in this room I think are familiar with, is the CEOs for Sustainability Executive Network. This is an independent business network, uh, and to our knowledge is the nation's only group of CEOs providing this kind of regional thought leadership around holistic business sustainability for people, planet, and prosperity. And CEOs for Sustainability, along with Sustainable Pittsburgh, has been active, especially across the last year, in taking a close look at this topic of regional decarbonization and what that means. Whether it's to reduce costs and business risks, strengthen relationships with suppliers and key stakeholders, or drive innovation, business leaders are increasingly appreciating the importance of carbon emission reduction. This group understands the benefits for regional economic development, some of which I'll talk about uh, in, in this uh, presentation, as well as public health, shared prosperity, and is acutely aware of the significant challenges uh, in achieving net zero goals. More and more CEOs though, and I think this is also not a surprise to the folks in this room, are incredibly focused on the incredible opportunities that decarbonization presents uh, for the region the region, state, and globe. So why decarbonization? I was told not to go into some, you know, uh, in, into a lot of detail on the importance of why we're all here, why we're doing this. Um, but uh, because you all are already familiar with the notion of climate change, but I did want to put up this nugget just in case, uh, in case you missed it. Um, so this is a picture of Earth surface temperatures uh, showing deviations from historical average in red and yellow to the high end and blue to the cool end um, from NASA Scientific Visualization uh, Studio. Uh, and the quote is also taken from the description of this image, which is that human-driven greenhouse gas emissions have rebounded following the dip in 2020. In case, so in case you missed it, um, Recently, international scientists, including those at NASA, determined carbon dioxide emissions are, were at the highest on record in 2022. And these deviations from the, the, the uh, historical average, I think, are also important, considering that 2022 was, a third, was a, the third in a string of La Nina years. You can see that kind of cooler than average Pacific Ocean part. Um, and yet, it was still tied for the fifth warmest year on record. So this is significant, and it's a challenge that we are continuing to face and need to continue to make significant progress on. Um, if we were to avoid long-lasting and irreversible impacts, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the remaining equivalent CO2 budget is very small, which implies large, immediate, and unprecedented global efforts to mitigate greenhouse gases are required. This was a finding uh, from the scientific consensus uh, globally um, found with high confidence uh, that this is what we need to do. So what, what can we do? Sustainable Pittsburgh uh, co-hosted with the CEOs for Sustainability uh, last year four stakeholder convenings uh, and did a stakeholder survey. Uh, and, and additionally, there were many learnings uh, from the Global Clean Energy Action Forum, the picture of which I, I showed a, a panel that we hosted there um, earlier, uh, as well as in other sessions. And we're grateful to everybody, many of whom are here today, uh, who participated in these conversations in each of these ways, and we learned a lot. And you can see we got a lot of information uh, from those convenings. And what does that all distill to in terms of synthesizing an overall framework or strategy? Where are people? What are we thinking about how to approach the topic of regional decarbonization? Well, three key priorities emerged from this conversation. One is change is needed at scale. Um, we need to meet the scale of our challenges across companies and in every sector. We need deployment of zero and low carbon technologies and we need enabling policy. That's currently, we were looking a lot at the, the uh, federal legislation that's been passed, but really it's about continuing kind of that evolution of policy development and technology implementation that will help drive the, help drive the change we need and the reductions we need to see at scale. The second principle, is meaningful community engagement. 
Uh, and that is really, really important. I think that there's a lot of conversation about what communities need that doesn't always engage the communities themselves. Um, and that that's a challenge, right? I think that we need to get, um, we need to uh, really improve uh, the uh, inclusive way that we are designing solutions, such that there's a bi-directional conversation between uh, decision makers and uh, communities. And whether we're talking urban or rural, whether we're talking workforce or industry impact or siting of solar arrays, community involvement is key for, cr uh, critical for successful design uh, and implementation of those solutions. And then lastly, uh, overarching principle-wise, measurement and accountability. Uh, we absolutely need to do this, and we need to continue to improve from where we are right now in doing this. Um, we do have some national pieces of this that are coming into play um, with SEC guidance on reporting emissions, opportunities through voluntary frameworks uh, like CDP, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, but we need more and more robust and comprehensive systems uh, for measure, measuring, measuring uh, emissions reductions uh, that can hold whatever technologies we're implementing and whatever community engagement strategies we're engaging in uh, accountable uh, to both those carbon reduction and those equity goals. Climate stability isn't achieved by promises and pledges. They are an important first step, and I think it's wonderful that we're in the space where we're seeing so much of that. But we really need uh, to, to be uh, enhancing uh, the feasibility and uh, holding ourselves accountable to those goals. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about electricity generation um, first, even though I know we're here to talk about industrial decarbonization, um, because I think that the projections for power in a decarbonized future um, il do illustrate some key points and some opportunities uh, for leverage. So the first thing I wanted to show uh, was an adapted graph um, from a pre-publication article from Zero Lab at Princeton. Many familiar with Zero Lab? Okay, seeing some hands, a little bit of nodding going on. Some folks, I think, still, uh, still waking up, and I actually maybe include myself in that just a little bit uh, this morning. Daylight savings time has taken a, taken a bit to, to sink in for me this year. Um, this is an adapted graph. It's showing power generation projections for the PJM grid uh, in which we sit. So a couple of points on this. So and it's pretty, it's kind of busy, um, and I apologize because in my uh, in my uh, translation of this, the uh, red appearing on these in this graph is nuclear energy. That's noted in the legend, but without the color. Um, so what you can see uh, is where we are today, or roughly today in 2021, in terms of energy generation mix and where we are headed in 2035 under a range of policy scenarios. Um, and so I wanna just point out a couple things. One is that according to the authors of this report, by 2030, zero carbon generation solutions, including renewables, hydrogen, biomass, and nuclear energy will account for approximately 60% of PJM's total generation. Um, we are on a, the cusp of a massive shift in how we get electricity. The second point that I wanna make is that, uh, just reinforcing the earlier point that I made, that all of this work that we're embarking upon uh, depends on continuing uh, policy development um, and support uh, for the energy transition. This report also points out that to reach deep decarbonization goals by 2035, the capacity that needs to be interconnected can be as high as 20 to 27 gigawatts a year by the 2031 to 2035 time period. This is tenfold more uh, than, than we're doing um, and is also about double what is currently incentivized by the Inflation Reduction Act alone uh, during this time period. So we do still have work to do incentives to create, um, and I think um, uh, to, to, stay, to stay on track with the important progress that we're making. Um, the good news is that accelerated pace of zero carbon electricity generation is cost competitive. That report uh, reports that as well, um, and this is the analysis reported by the Ohio River Valley Institute uh, also in December. I believe, in fact, um, this report predicts a lower cost for a zero carbon generation pathway. 
Uh, it leaves analysis of industrial de decarbonization as a next step, but in, as a next step, but in terms of power generation, um, shows the plausibility of really going in hard and big on uh, zero carbon uh, electricity generation. So let's talk about industry. Let's switch from power to in industry and talk about what it will take to decarbonize. First of all, it's tough, and I think that's why we're all here, uh, to discuss the challenges that are inherent in doing this. Um, there's a reason that industry electrification and decarbonization was chosen as an MIT grant, climate grand challenge, and I'll show some of the report, uh, some of the uh, work um, from the folks who helped to initiate the, the the center there on this topic. So the lead scientists on this flagship project, they need four pillars to be addressed, uh, including ethylene, steel, and cement production, uh, and ammonia. In this region, ethylene and steel are, I think, the biggest, uh, biggest, the biggest uh, important, the, the two most important of those pillars. Um, any credible plan to decarbonize industry has to uh, affect the production of these pillars, um, but it's difficult for several reasons, and those were, are given uh, in this uh, document as follows. Uh, one, just to level set, make sure we're all on the same page, because I think it's important stage setting for the conversation that will happen across the rest of the day. One is that a large share of the pillars associated emissions is due to carbon in feedstocks, right? This is a, these are chemical reactions that result in the production of carbon dioxide. Um, that's a difficult thing to, to design around. Uh, Secondly, industrial processes are highly integrated. So if you make changes in one place, you're really changing a lot of things upstream and downstream from the process that have to be taken into consideration. Third, capital investments in industry are amortized over decades, uh, which means that decisions made decades ago continue to impact present and future emissions. And future, as in the decisions we make today, will impact you know, what the possibility space looks like into the future. And lastly, these products are commodities with small profit margins uh, and uh, for which externalities are not, uh, not built into the value. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of those externalities on the next slide, but that makes invest investments uh, in the innovation challenging. Taken together, these factors mean that, and these are the words of the, the authors here, um, means that uh, decarbonization of industry will require a bold, expansive strategy that moves beyond minor investments in process efficiency at the margins. Uh, it is without question a climate grant challenge. Um, and so I just wanted to state that verbatim because it calls back to the quote that I showed you from the IPCC, right? And to what I said in the very beginning of this talk is that we need to be thinking boldly about what to do. And we need to uh, think less about iteration and more about transformation. So uh, I mentioned I would talk about externalities. This is a super busy graph um, from the National Centers for Environmental Information, but the trends are clear in terms of some of those externalities, right? This is the nation's, uh, this agency is the nation's scorekeeper in terms of addressing severe weather and climate events in their historical perspective. And what they are showing is a pretty clear increasing trend in the number of billion dollar, uh, billion dollar uh, disasters uh, that, are, that have happened uh, in the country. Uh, this is significant. It, it's a dollars and cents cost that you know, we're starting to have to build into risk models uh, and, and things of that nature, but it also has a significant human cost as well. And in addition to that, another externality, uh, it was mentioned that I, I am on the County Board of Health. In fact, I will be unable to stay for the whole day because there is a Board of Health meeting today. Uh, but externalities like the ones, uh, like the one just mentioned, um, include the impacts to public health. Um, this is back to, uh, this is actually from the Net Zero America report. Um, you can see the business as usual case all the way on the left here, um, projecting out across time. Uh, it's worth pointing out, again, another busy graph, but that the red and pink lines correspond to modeled air pollutant deaths due to industrial processes. So that's uh, coal mining and oil and gas pr production specifically. Um, 
according to this analysis. And you can see that in all scenarios, all scenarios for uh, how we're transforming uh, the, the power sector, um, that uh, hundreds of thousands of lives are saved. So the point of most of the talk so far is basically this. Innovation is ongoing. Be ready. From innovations in smelting to wholesale re-envisioning of industrial processes, viability of new and game-changing technologies is also something that is going to be happening across the next several years. Um, I did read an analysis in preparation that green hydrogen uh, is slated to be cost competitive uh, by 2030, according to Bloom Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, we're looking at innovations uh, in technology. Boston Metals uh, is a good example of a company that's starting to create, think about how to create zero carbon steel. Uh, really, really kind of revolutionizing the way we think about how these processes is what I'm encouraging everyone to kind of take from today and from, from this talk, is that we have big changes to make and we should not be shy about doing that. How are we building infrastructure for tomorrow that holds a space open for innovation and experimentation? And it doesn't constrain um, what we can accomplish in the future. Will, be, will we be ready to iterate to get to that next level of performance? So uh, in thinking about how technologies are transforming, transforming the landscape, um, you know, uh, I think about technological paradigms, socio-technical paradigms, I believe is uh, the, the term in the literature. And this is taken um, from an article about technical, technological transitions. And what we're doing right now is we're essentially creating a, a transition state. We're creating a new paradigm um, intentionally uh, to meet the goals that we've set out in front of us. And this is a quote from this article. Technological regimes result in technological trajectories because the community of engineers researchers in the same direction. They create stability because they guide the innovative activity toward incremental improvements along trajectories. In, summer, in summary, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? We, we're looking, uh, I want to encourage this group to think beyond the iterative solutions and look for, again, the transformation ones. And, you know, we, but we have existing technologies, as were mentioned, you know, this is a, an area that has been built on the economic power of industry, as was mentioned. Um, I've put up here uh, some, uh, uh, the legend from a figure that uh, was just a map, but since we actually have some of this infrastructure here, I thought it'd be more meaningful to put the infrastructure up. Uh, this is the Edgar Tonson Steel Mill in Braddock, a few miles from here. Uh, and, you know, it's worth pointing out that, you know, we're thinking about how to, how to revolutionize, uh, how to revolutionize these industries that we've had for, with us for a very long time and have been so important um, but with technologies. And you can see it's not quite cut off, um, but there's not that many um, of, of the blast furnaces that exist in this way across the country. And thinking about how to decarbonize um, these facilities is very difficult. I want to touch um, also on uh, another topic, um, which is very important and uh, that Sustainable Pittsburgh is doing specific work around, um, and that is clean energy workforce. So this is one of seven immediate next steps for the region uh, that kind of fell out of the conversation that I was talking about earlier where we had three, those three overarching principles, scale, community engagement, and, uh, and uh, uh, measurement and accountability. Um, one of those immediate next steps is clean energy workforce development and making sure that the increasing demand for clean energy workers is met with a diverse and appropriately trained workforce. Last week, uh, I didn't make it into my slides because it happened just as they were coming due, but the E2 Clean Jobs Report dropped, uh, reporting over 90,000 clean energy jobs in Pennsylvania. 
Um, we are now in the top 10 states for jobs in this sector, uh, and they look like a bunch of different things, including construction, including uh, grid, including energy efficiency, um, clean vehicles, uh, inclusive of all of that, all, all, of those, all of those different sectors, hugely important. And I don't wanna try and set the stage without noting also um, the importance of the conversation around circularity. You know, we're having a lot more conversations about this now, and I think that that's really, uh, really key. Uh, this is a screenshot of the circularity gap report for 2022, um, pointing out that uh, between COP25 and COP26, 70% more virgin materials were extracted than what the earth can safely replenish. Uh, the authors also assert that 70% of our, our carbon emissions come from material handling and use, which if you think about it, makes some sense. And so, you know, this is a really key part of the picture that I don't want to be lost as we are thinking about manufacturing uh, and use of materials. This is work that Sustainable Pittsburgh has already begun in some ways. This slide shows screenshots from an event that we held last year, tapping opportunities in the circular economy, um, which attracted uh, it attracted a number of attendees, very high interest in this topic. Um, and in addition to the folks pictured, um, we were able to uh, bring in um, uh, local players in reuse uh, and manufacturing from uh, Construction Junction from Covestro. Uh, the new opportunities that are made possible by investment in the national and international efforts that are underway and conversations with those, from conversations in the, with those in our networks we know that the interest for developing and implementing solutions uh, in, in the space of circularity is high. So just a quick word about the biggest enabling legislation that we currently have um, as I, as I uh, wind down here, uh, pointing out that this is the most important thing in front of us, as we all know, to help us achieve scale. According to our analysis, uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the IIJA, creates $38.5 billion in competitive programs across many sectors uh, with where uh, decarbonization is important. Some of these programs are available to individual companies. Some require multi-sector collaboration. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act enables almost 10 times that amount, primarily through rebates and tax credits, as well as through establishing um, establishing other programs uh, and support for national assistance. So both of these pieces of legislation have a central focus on equity in underserved energy justice and environmental justice communities and specifically support U.S. manufacturing. So while the bipartisan infrastructure law may appear narrowly focused on physical infrastructure, um, viewing it through a multi-sector lens illustrates a roadmap with which uh, numerous pathways uh, can exist in our common mission to decarbonize. And in looking at industry specifically, Pennsylvania can compete nationally for dozens of new grant programs, specifically in manufacturing, including battery manufacturing, processing and recycling across battery value chain, clean energy manufacturing, as well as consortium-based applications for certain programs. There's a complex interplay uh, between climate drivers, social context, economic development pathways, and health outcomes. Um, this is a slide showing a windmill, well, wind turbines in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. Um, there is a hydraulic fracturing fluid reservoir in the middle of it, and it's in this just beautiful uh, landscape, uh, Penn's Woods. Zero carbon energy generation is a huge part of the decarbonization solution. Deep electrification will create more electricity demand, the scale up of renewables and the modifications in the power sector, along with continued innovations, will continue to have impacts on the industrial sector. So I have a couple questions um, for you. I know there's gonna be a little bit of Q&A time for me, I think we still have time for that. Um, but uh, a couple of questions for you to consider and to keep with you as you, you go across the, the event today and these really important conversations that are happening. How are we scaling up 
our infrastructure for tomorrow that holds a space open for innovation and improvements. Let's not hold a hammer in search of nails, right? Are we, in, are we looking, are we investing in the best path? Um, and the times that we're in call for truly bold action. So let's think about that. How are we creating those investments in the best strategies to move forward to achieve our goals? Second question, how are we making sure that we're not leaving anyone out of opportunities and helping to design the solutions that benefit them and their communities? What do we have to do to make sure that this energy transition makes economic development outcomes fair? You know, it is a lot easier to, I think, uh, increase public support for, for the transition and the changes that are needed if it actually is better uh, for people. Uh, so let's use what we have in terms of uh, federal incentives um, and the uh, increasingly important approach of meaningfully engaging communities to build those social equity pieces. And how are we embracing growth, energy, and growth industries in the energy sector and making sure um, that opportunities are available to everyone? So those are the questions I'm going to ask you to take with you um, as we go today. Uh, how are we make, holding open that space for the questions we haven't asked or answered yet? Uh, and how are we making sure that this is an improvement for all? And with that, I will close and ask for questions. Thank you, Joylette. That was an amazing keynote. Really set the stage for the entire day. Um, few ground rules. Uh, so we made it a policy this year. We're going to prioritize the first question from every Q&A session to come from a student. So if you're a student and you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, we'll come over to you. The second rule is please keep it short and succinct because we only have roughly 10, 15 minutes and I want to make sure that anyone who wants to ask a question is able to. Thank you so much. My name is Maya, and I'm a PhD student here at uh, chemical, I guess, in chemical engineering. My question for you is, what are the next milestones that sustainable Pittsburgh is kind of going after, and what are those deliverables that you're hoping from um, in those milestones? Um, milestones in terms of, could you be a little more specific? Yeah, like, are there things that you're looking forward to, either in terms of, like, rolling out or programs that you're trying to push, um, anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, what is Sustainable Pittsburgh uh, looking to roll out across uh, maybe the next span of time here? Well, I'll, I'll say that, you know, our focus right now really is a lot on some of the things that, we're, we, that I've talked about in terms of we are very much focused on decarbonization and how we can help uh, how we can help companies and communities. It was mentioned earlier, and we focused a lot on the for-profit context here today, but we work a lot uh, with local government. Uh, so also making sure that all of those stakeholders are connected to the opportunities and have the ability to, um, to design and implement plans that will, that will help them along their path. That's kind of where we, where we sit in terms of uh, both that assistance and that connect connection to other, uh, to other actors uh, in the region that can help advance those goals. So a lot, look for a lot more in terms of, um, uh, in terms of education and you know, events and uh, initiatives that are, that are focused on the decarbonization piece, but also never losing sight of the equity piece. Uh, and I know that was woven throughout my talk, but just to reinforce that those are not separate issues. Uh, and uh, for us, we very much are focused on how we can take what is happening, all of the growth, all of the change, all of the um, opportunity, um, and make sure that we're not just achieving those environmental goals, but we're achieving social goals as well. I have another question in the back. Uh, this isn't a, a question. It's just uh, actually a, a shout out for the CEOs for sustainability. Um, if you are a local or regional company and you're not involved with the CEOs, uh, you should talk to Joylet because it's a, um, you know, my experience uh, sitting on it as a as a uh, from a nonprofit organization, Rand Corporation, is that it's a place for organizations to learn from each other and um, push each other to do their best. And if you're a company that's not there, you should 
you should think about getting there. Thank you very much, Amy. Any questions around the room? Hi, Joylette. I have a question in terms of communicating. You talked about the importance of community engagement. And I know over the years, um, the advice has sort of flip-flopped about when you're talking to the general public, whether terms like decarbonization, climate change, are like too <laughs> polarizing um, versus no, like, should we just be direct and talk about what we're talking about? I would just love to hear your thoughts on when you're engaging with the general public, with communities, how to handle that messaging. That is an excellent question, and many books have been written on this subject. I think, um, and there's, I don't think there's a straightforward answer because the answers continue to shift, you know? I think that now we, you know, are in a space where the impacts of climate change are being felt, right? So, you know, there's an opportunity to, I think, talk very directly about that um, and link it to people's real world experience. I think that um, you know the, even even the notion of the the word decarbonization, right? I think uh, regionally, one thing that we are, are are seeing is that that even that even that term, you know, starts to mean a very specific you know pathway and a very specific set of technologies like. The, the hydrogen conversation, the conversation about hydrogen, you know, is very much, you know, using that terminology and thinking about how to be specific about a really broad, multi-sector, equity-centered uh, decarbonization conversation and, and holding that space open. Um, I think that, you know, there's, I don't have a great straight answer for you. I think really in my experience and communicating with any audience, it really comes down to trying to meet people, uh, meet people where they are, or actually there's a term in education called the, the zone of proximal ignorance, where you don't want, yeah, it's interesting, I really thought this, this stuck with me when I learned it years ago. So there's, you know, the space of things that people know, and then there's maybe everything that you know over here, but you can't teach from here, right? You have to meet people just outside of, you know, their knowledge and, you know, open those doors. And so I think I always think about that with, you know, every, every, every conversation that I have with different stakeholders. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perlock, for sharing. Hey, uh, my name is Jetson. I'm a student in the EC department, lecturing in computer engineering. So, regarding community engagements, how do you how do we motivate more students to go into the climate tech field? So, students otherwise would work in the big tech uh, companies. How do we motivate them, incentivize them to to join the climate fight? Yeah, how do you incentivize climate tech? I mean, I think a lot of that comes back to um, some of the underlying issues that I was that, that I think need to happen in terms of creating those incentives, right? And thinking about what what we're enabling with different policies and programs, such that that the, there is a uh, more that more of that desire can be cultivated for people to use their skills in those ways. If that's where you're coming from, right? I think that if there's space for companies to start and grow and uh, be incubated, and there are programs to support that, of which there are some, um, and there's uh, incentives for them to continue in that work to make it easy and feasible, easier and feasible. I'm not going to claim that startup is easy, um, but uh, that I think that. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done to encourage kind of the landscape around uh, startup cultures, uh, the startup culture in climate tech, and there's more that certainly we could be doing on that front. I'm not sure if that was a satisfying answer, but let's just do more and, and make sure that that's prioritized as more possible. You know, there's, I think a lot of the work that we do um, the, from the community engagement pieces, to every, every piece of this, right, requires intentionality. Um, we have to very specifically say we want to support, you know, we want to support climate tech startups. We want to support um, uh, innovation. 
Uh, and we want to do community engagement in meaningful ways, and we're gonna prioritize doing that. We're not gonna think about it as an, as an add-on thing at the end of the process once we already figured out all of the solutions and we just want the communities to, to get on board. And you'll probably hear more of that in the, in the panel later. I'm a little off topic of your question. But. Yeah, um, you mentioned earlier on the challenges of kind of convening or, or dealing with the industrial sector, um, you know, given capital cost issues and, and uh, margins. Uh, you know, just uh, set in their ways. Um, and I've, I've been involved with the Green Building Alliance and Green Building Council for a long time. And one of the things is that I think that the 2030 district has actually been fairly effective in convening a large group of, of you know, folks into the space. And I'm pushing for the idea of kind of creating a 2030 district approach for the industrial sector as well. Um, because I, I don't know how you're convening these folks to have the conversation um, or to you know, enlist them in the process. So I, that, just a thought, but mm -hmm. wondering uh, what we're doing to kind of get at that conversation, because if we don't have the conversation, we're never gonna make progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I apologize, it was a, even a little bit hard for me to hear from up here, but I heard you mention um, the importance of programs like the 2030 District, which is run by uh, Green Building Alliance, um, and agree. I didn't mention that, but in terms of measurement and accountability as a regional framework, it's, uh, it's certainly excellent um, for uh, tracking and measuring that progress and encouraging additional progress. Um, and I think that you, know, you also mentioned doing something similar for the industrial sector. Um, I think that we're in a really, we're in a really interesting time right now where I think a lot of the pathways are still being figured out and we're still figuring out what's possible, the shape of what's possible. Um, I think that an approach like that could, could, make, could make a lot of sense as more things start getting implemented and people start getting a little further down the, down the path of actually creating the reductions that, um, that are, uh, that are being described, right? And that, that goes exactly to the accountability piece that you point out, that you know, we have to make sure that um, we are, uh, we're looking at the outcomes uh, and not, not simply the pledges. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Good morning. Um, Brigadier General Robert Bowie, Carnegie Mellon, ECE alum. Um, how do you measure the effectiveness, effectiveness of your community engagement? In the Air Force, we call it climate literacy. How do you, uh, we're struggling with getting the baseline of all of our airmen and then deciding on how to do engagements and training and seeing how to move forward. How do you baseline that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the community engagement piece is gonna look a little different in each context, right? It depends on kind of what you're engaging around. If you're engaging around workforce, that looks different and there are different partners than if you're engaging around um, uh, sort of uh, impacts to the landscape or uh, construction projects um, that may be happening around pipelines or, or something like that. Um, I think that so <laughs> again, I'm giving a non-answer answer, but uh, I think that there are a number of best practices, um, starting from making sure that communities are engaged early um, and meaningfully in conversations about design and providing input, uh, and that can look like a number of different ways, you know, from community meetings to, to different surveys and different kinds of outreach to um, how you're setting the tables for decision making. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach in, in each scenario. It will take understanding the community, building those community connections uh, and those relationships with community-based organizations um, and, uh, and making sure that the, that the conversations are being had everywhere they need to be had, which is, which is a commitment, you know, and I'm not... I, I keep coming back to it and stressing it because it's something that historically we don't necessarily do very well. Um, but we, and, and it's an investment of time and energy and, and you know, making sure that that's happening. But it's, it's critical, I think, to the long-term success of any of these projects and certainly to those intersectional goals. All right. Uh, thank you so much for all the really good questions. And Joylette, thank you for such a good keynote. Uh, let's give her one last round of applause.